My name is Joy Clark. I'm the Publicity and Promotions Chair for the SMU, the Spiritualist National Union. I'm delighted this afternoon to welcome you here for this tutorial, and it's my privilege to introduce Minister Judy Seaman. Thank you. Don't clap till I finish, you might not like it. <laughs> Basically, what I want us to have a think about today is the use of physical energy, physical energy. And in our spiritualism, more recently, it's come that people you say physical and they hear you saying exoplasm. And the two things are not the same. And we need to begin to recognise that that when spiritualism, when the phenomenon began, it didn't begin with ectoplasm. It began with pure physical energy, creating wrappings and movement. And that energy, that power, um, was used tremendously by the early uh, mediums of that time. So let's go back even before the beginning of modern spiritualism. Let's go back into the late, mid to late 1700s. A gentleman called, Frank, well, his name wasn't actually Franz Anton Mesmer, but he became known as that. And he became aware of this magnetic force. He, he stuck rods into um, tubs of water and found that there was a magnetic energy. And he started to use this as a healing therapy, so lots of you will have heard of Mesmer. And he had salons with lots of draped curtains and things to make it all feel very etheric and weird and wonderful. And of course that makes a big difference, doesn't it, you know? And uh, he would um, go and magnetise a tree and he would say, you can all go to this tree and you will feel the healing power. And uh, there is a story that he also, people who were very rich and wealthy, would learn how to use this magnetic energy. Um, and then their servants would come to them and kings. In fact, uh, I think uh, the, the last English king to, to be a healing king was somewhere in the 1800s. I've actually forgotten the, the king it was now. Where people went to the king's court for healing, for this uh, powerful physical energy known as animal magnetism. <coughs> the story, the amusing story, is that um, one of his uh, servants came to him and said, We're sorry, but there's a problem. The people are going to the tree and they're not feeling anything. Um, and then he said, But, but they're saying they feel better afterwards, even though they couldn't feel any energy. So he went and had a look and he said, it's because they're going to the wrong tree. <laughs> <laughs> so psychologically, they thought they were going to the right tree, but they weren't actually getting this physical energy. But the reason I've kind of started with that is that if we go back to our pioneers, long before Hydesville, there was Andrew Jackson Davis, a spiritualist pioneer. And he was a very uh, ill-educated man. Six months part-time education is all he'd had in his lifetime. But he went to um, a mesmerist who was visiting his town, Poughkeepsie, in America. And he put himself forward to be a victim for this uh, mesmerist. And he fell into um, an altered state. And he called this altered state the superior condition. And in that superior condition, he was able to visit, be aware of, see the spirit world. And he, in particular, was very uh, overwhelmed by watching how children in the spirit world were cared for and how they were educated. And based on that, he set up in America what was called the Lyceum Movement. And it was to, he got children to come together 
in what were called lyceums, types of school gatherings, wealthy and poor, and they were all cared for in the same way. And they did things like calisthenics, exercises, and marching, and singing. And it was for the welfare. And the wealthy children brought in uh, their, uh, some money, and the money helped. So the Lycia movement was born in America. And it was based on his understanding of the spirit world. So he created the Lycia Manual, which was schooling manual for children within the spiritualist movement. But this man, in this superior condition that he called it, it was a trance state, an altered state of consciousness, whereby he was entranced. And he wrote books called things like Nature's Divine Revelations. I happen to have an original copy of that book. Um, I've been downloading my collection of books because uh, I'm a bit of an old books. Really, I love them. But that's one I'm not letting go of. It's very, very hard to read. But for a man who'd had six months part-time education, he couldn't have written it. It's impossible. And, and he wrote lots of wonderful spiritual books far beyond his learning. So he was one of our original pioneers who, being mesmerized, enabled to move into this altered state, provided him with the facility to begin to access his <coughs> trans mediumship. And through that trans mediumship, he made a big impression in America on the spiritualist movement. And on the 31st of March, 1848, he is known to have said, um, having sat for his trance state, he said, it has begun, a living experience is born. And of course that was the physical energy that took place in the cottage at Hinesville, where the raps started. And uh, the peddler who was buried in the cellar, Rosna, began to communicate, and the young girls there had the means <coughs> ability to enable that to take place. This was physical energy, but we're not talking about ectoplasm. We are talking about pure physical energy. Physical energy in mediumship doesn't have to include the use of ectoplasm, and somehow nowadays it seems to be that that's what everybody thinks. You say physical, ectoplasm, blackout, everything in the dark. This did not happen in the beginning. It didn't. So we need to remember that. This was not how it started. So what does this physical energy manifest? First of all, in those early years, wonderful what were called automatrists, who would sit. They weren't moving into a trance state as such. I could sit with this young lady here and we could have a chat. And while I'm doing that, I would have a pen or pencil in my hand and the spirit world would be writing, automatic writing. I don't know anything that's being written. It's not coming through my mind. It's being written on the paper. We don't need any kind of exoplasm for that. It's <coughs> using that physical energy to control. Automatrists were renowned as wonderful physical mediums. And one of the um, psychic uh, analysis, the Society for Psychical Science believes that some of the uh, evidence given through automatic writing was the best evidence ever. Because some of the members of the SPR promised that they would <coughs> communicate in a way that would prove it was them, Myers and Gurney and so on. And so they communicated through automatrists all around the world, miles away from each other. And until those pieces were put together, it didn't make any sense. But when it was put together, it told a specific story about one of our English prime ministers, <coughs> Balfour, and his young lady, Elizabeth. And when it was put together, they called it the Palm Sunday case. And as far as psychical researchers are concerned, it is the most evidential. That's what they said. 
So do, through doing this, the autonomic variety, wonderful evidence uh, came forward. Scotography and photography also, table tilting, wrapping. And also we're going to look at how physical energy was used in demonstrating mediumship, platform mediumship, and in healing. All of those things in those early days. It is one of the ladies who used them. Estelle Roberts. Have you all heard of Estelle Roberts? Where before she demonstrated in big venues like the Royal Albert Hall for thousands of people, she used magnetic passes on herself to empower herself with physical energy, magnetic energy. And a lot of the mediums in that day did that so they could sustain their mediumship for long periods of time. Physical energy helped them. They believed it was necessary, and there is one of Emma's books um, that mentions it. Well, one of the books that she edited and put together, Emma Harding's Britain, that talks about these physical passes. And some years ago here, um, a very good friend of mine, Stephen Upton, decided he wanted to try out these passes that he'd read in the book. And he asked for a volunteer amongst the tutors, and one of the tutors offered himself who'd never even considered transmediumship. Stephen did what he thought was the passes to induce stronger clairvoyance, clairaudience, and then the medium fell into a trance state. And a control spoke to him and said, you're doing the wrong passes, and told him how to do the passes that he wanted to actually do. And that was through somebody who'd never done any sort of trance before. So clearly, using the passes did work. Had pass uh, Stephen then used the passes, the right ones, on Stella, his wife, for a, before a service. And she said that the information was coming through her so fast, she couldn't get out of her mouth fast enough. But the problem was that when the service was over, she couldn't switch off. She was still buzzing and buzzing. Now, I don't know, um, and she said she certainly wouldn't allow him to do it again, because, but I think that the difference was the mediums like Estelle ha did these passes on themselves. Stephen is a very powerful magnetic energy, and I think it was too much for Estelle. That's my opinion. So working with them, we have to need to understand them. But in uh, Estelle's circle, there was no ectoplasm. This was what was called scotography. They put uh, photographic paper in the circle, no cameras, and put it through the developing as we've done in this room during experimental sessions. And these were the pictures that came on the paper. This was a picture of Red Cloud, Estelle Roberts, one of her guides. And these are some of the other pictures that was called scotography. In other words, Images, sorry if my head's in the way, but if I let go of this chair, I'll fall off this platform. So um, my legs are not as good as they used to be. Um, so this scotography uh, was loads and loads of it came through in Estelle Roberts' home circle. Uh, I know they're not terribly clear on there, but there were some tremendous images. Plus we got things like spirit photography, um, in particular a man called William Hope was very, very interested in this aspect. And uh, here we see, uh, some of you may or may not know, Ernest Tobin was once um, a president of the SNU. And the gentleman sitting in the middle there is Ernest Tobin there. And can you see the spirit extras around him? Uh, this would just come on a normal film, black and white film, um, and the the energy, the physical energy that the spirit world could use manifested a change on the photographic image to produce what was called spirit extras. And just to let you know that this was not just something that was necessarily done uh, with determination, with intent. Three elderly ladies were going to go on holiday to Blackpool together. 
and one of them passed away to the spirit world before they went. And whilst they were there, the two of them went into one of these photographic booths to have their pictures taken. And as you can see, the third lady turned up because if you look at that in a mirror, it spells Lily, and that was her name. And it came out spontaneously on the photograph that was taken there in the booth at Blackpool. So if the energy is there, it can happen. When we look now, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Bang Sisters. Amazing. No ectoplasm, nothing like this, no dark seances, nothing. They would perhaps pin a, um, a canvas in the window or on, on, uh, or on there. And they would sit either side of this canvas. They would put uh, paints in a pot, all colours in together, no brushes. They stick them all together. And this was the kind of uh, results that happened. This came on the canvas. Beautiful paintings like this one. And there's a close-up of it. Look at the detail on that. There would be all kinds of paints put in the pot, and there are two of these originals at Portsmouth Temple Church still, if you're interested in seeing them. Um, one of them recently had to be um, uh, attended to because it was going mouldy on the corner. And so they, they were behind glass. They took it from behind the glass and it's still in the same state as it was when it was done. And it's like a beautiful, like a powdery texture. Perfect. And look at the detail on that face. It's not very good there, I have to say, actually. It's much better. In fact, I can turn this around without ruining it. You see it back there. That's not a very good image there, unfortunately, at all. But they were really um, magnificent. And here's another one of, of a gentleman, another bank paint. <coughs> there, you see it's much better there than it is up there. The image, these were absolutely. But what was more amazing was that these images, after they'd been completed, could change. And one gentleman who was big, part of the SNU went along for a sitting and with the Bank Sisters, and it was his sister that the painting came out. And he said it was absolutely beautiful, it was fantastic. But when he saw it, he in his mind, he thought, really not deliberately, it's lovely, but I preferred her when she wore a, a oh, the down. So he took the painting home with him, and when he woke up the next morning, the hair was up. Not done. So all of this physical energy at use through the various aspects of mediumship. This man, uh, William Lilly, he lived uh, in the village where I was born. And he, at the age of 10, his mum took him to a spiritualist church. And uh, in the church, he fell into a trance state and a control spoke through him and said, don't bring him back to church, start a home circle and we will teach him. And for five years, they taught Lily to be an excellent medium, a healing medium and a herbalist. And when he was 15, <coughs> this was during the war, Second World War, he went to work as was the case for young men. And he would walk to work six miles to Leeds, a big industrial city, and he would work on the night shift and then coming home in the morning, he would gather herbs and he would turn them into remedies. And then he would go out, putting out remedies and healing at the age of 15, he was doing this. And someone, a man who had a big munitions factory in Leeds, heard about him. And his friend was in Leeds Infirmary Hospital, very ill. And um, this control that spoke through Lily in the church was called Dr. Latari Singh. And Dr. Latari Singh could diagnose patients without ever seeing them. So this man with the factory wanted to test Lily. And he arranged for three surgeons from Leeds Infirmary to come along and meet him. 
and they each brought uh, some notes relevant to a particular patient, which Lily didn't see. And the trans control came through, Dr. Latari Singh, and diagnosed each patient. The first one, he said something like, sorry, your patient will pass away. It is time for them to pass. There's nothing we can do, etc." cetera. Um, and they also had nurses watching all the equipment and everything as this was going on to see what happened with the patients. The second one, he said, we will start healing immediately. Uh, your patient will survive, etc., etc. And the results in the hospital was that the monitors did start to pick up immediately at the time they said this. The third one, he diagnosed the patient had cancer, which the surgeon agreed, but he disagreed with the site of the cancer. And so Dr. Sain said to him, your patient will pass away within three weeks. And if you do an autopsy, you will find that I'm correct. Pretty strong stuff, hmm? do you think? <laughs> but he was. They did do an autopsy. He was right, and the surgeon was wrong. And he recorded that. So this man who owned this munitions factory told Lily to stop work. He was going to pay him a wage, and he gave him part of his factory as a clinic. And people would queue up outside, because this is my neck of the woods, Leeds, where I come from in Yorkshire. And I know where that is, Black Bull Street in Hunslet in Leeds, for free healing and free herbal remedies and homeopathic remedies that the spirit world had taught Lilla. And they taught him so much, and he practiced this all free. In the end, he had a clinic in London, and he practiced there until... He was accused of practicing medicine without a license. So he left the country and went briefly to Holland and then to South Africa. When he moved to South, this is him in his clinic in London. I hope you can see, it's not very clear, unfortunately. I don't quite know why. But this is a young boy. I don't know how good these pictures are. Can you, can you see here, if I can get out of the way, this is a young boy, there's his head there, his body there. This is his arm here, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Can you see how the bone is all sticking out of his arm? He was 12 years of age, and uh, this was done in front of a gathering. The exact number is not really accurately recorded. But it was hundreds to over a thousand of doctors and medical students. And Lily uh, worked on this boy. And I don't know if you can see there, again it's difficult, can you see what's just above his arm? Can you see that there? I think it works very well either. Let me get the other side of it again. Can you see that there? Well, this was the bone being dematerialized out of the boy's arm. Asporter. Have you heard of apports and asport? Asport is where it goes from. Apport is where it comes from. This diseased bone was asported out of his arm, and a new bone was formed in his arm. That boy lived with that new bone in his arm, became a man, Incredibly, the bone grew with him absolutely perfectly. And so there were a lot of questions put to Dr. Latari about how they could do this without the rejection. And his answer was that they took a microscopic fragment from every person present in the room to create that bone so that there would be no one DNA in it and the body could more easily absorb it mm -hmm. into the boy's body. That's physical mediumship. That's physical energy. For me, that is absolutely amazing. And he went on to work there in South Africa until he passed away. So thinking about the potential for use of physical energy is absolutely amazing. This is pure energy rods. That's a normal old black and white camera showing the energy in a room 
where there is a table there. It's a bit difficult to make the table out, but again, I'll try and point it out to you. It's, it's, oh, it's moved on when I take it down. <coughs> it's the here. There's the legs of the table there on this bottom right-hand corner. I don't know if you can see it. And those are some sitters in the room. Here are the legs of the table, here, and across the there. Uh, so that's pure physical energy presence in the room. This is a demonstration of mediumship in South Africa. <coughs> this was taken by a newspaper photographer. There's the medium there. Can you see her? Can you see her? That's the stage that she was on. A newspaper photographer took this with a normal camera. As you can see at bottom, it says, this photograph taken by a newspaper photographer of Murray Morris. She's a medium that Gordon Higginson used to talk about in this room a lot, tremendously. She was in Cape Town doing a demonstration of mediumship. Can you see all this energy here? Look at it. And it says, he called it Tones of Fire. That's what the newspaper photographer called it. Tones of fire. All this energy here filling the room. This is what the demonstrative mediums did. Empowered themselves, empowered the area in which they were working so that they could demonstrate to a huge gathering of people. And they didn't lose their power. They weren't working psychically. They were working in that power using physical mediumship. Now, you wouldn't associate now physical mediumship with demonstrating, would you? Would you even associate it with healing? Maybe, maybe. But why not? Why not? What have we lost? If we go to uh, Emma Hardinge Britton, when she first started with her mediumship, she sat with crystals in her hands. When she was doing sittings, she, those crystals are up in the museum. Physical energy, source of physical energy. So a lot of these mediums of yesteryear knew how to use the physical energy. There she is, Emma Hardinge Britton. She traveled the world giving trans lectures she didn't know what she was going to lecture on until maybe five minutes before she did it. She would go, the people there would tell her what they wanted the lecture on. She would move into a trance control and lecture on subjects that she knew nothing about. Not just spiritual stuff, astrophysics, all kinds of things. But she used the physical energy to empower herself, to be able to enable those control to speak through her and do that kind of uh, mediumship, which it was, trans-mediumship, trans-control mediumship. So briefly, just to wind up looking at this, this is not very good at all. I don't quite know why it's so bad. Um, it's just to summarize, really. The use of physical energy is not confined to any one form of mediumship. We can, it can and it does enhance and empower all forms of mediumship if we use it, if we work with it. We should be utilising all forms of physical energy suitable for today's needs. What are today's needs? What do you think? Where do you think we should be using this physical energy today? Is there anybody there? Yes, lovely. I think myself to show, one idea is to show evidence to the everyday person with, and then uh, again I'll explain it without causing fear, because it's a lot of fear. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Lots of fear in healing. Absolutely. Healing in particular, mm -hmm. uh, because if we recognize that healing uh, many years ago, when it first came into being, it was considered to be touching the soul, healing the soul. And then it worked its way out through like self-healing. Now we know 
that healing addresses the, the person at all levels, mental, physical, emotional, spiritual. So, but for the physical level, it needs physical energy. I have sat in experimental seances where the spirit world are working to try to apport islets of Langerham into a type 1 diabetic. What do you think to that? It's not happening yet, but they're working on it. One of the issues we had was that where apports take place, it's very hot. I've worked with physical apports through my own mediumship. And there's always heat, because what is being asported and apported is broken down the molecular structure of it. Therefore, there's heat. Does that make sense with you? And as it's forming, and it doesn't, it doesn't just land, it doesn't just drop in. It forms, it reforms again, so the molecules come back together. So think of that inside the patient. And the patient was saying, no, no, it's too hot, I can't bear it. So they were working at it, but now they've got to do more and more work. Just imagine if they could affect that. Wouldn't that be better than anything you could imagine? To be able to make that kind of a difference, as you say, to healing. So many forms of healing, not just that. But using that physical energy in our modern world for healing would be absolutely amazing. Anything else you'd like to throw into this discussion? No? You're all having a little sleep, are you? That's okay. I don't know. Well, I think the main reason why we're moving away from this physical mediumship is because of the fear factor. Yeah. People don't understand it. Yeah. And I think most of all because I know of seances where people are locked in the room, even the door nailed, closed, total blackout, where your awareness becomes distorted, you do not, you feel weird, strange, made to work special clothing to go into it. This is pure psyching up, and it really is not necessary, it isn't. And that is why people are afraid, frightened of it. These are things that happen naturally, that don't need. Look at Lily in a room of thousands of people and physical phenomena taking place. Why do we need to why do we need to be in a blacked out room? We don't. We don't. And so we need to be able to see physical energy, what it can do. Ectoplasm was necessary because in its era. People have to see to believe and even touch to believe. And we know um, that, uh, for instance, uh, some of the mediumship, the physical, you could touch and feel the exoplasm. I witnessed in this room, this was the room where seances took place, wonderful physical phenomena. On one occasion, um, there was a storm, and a physical phenomena is amazing in a storm. And there was a huge bush just outside the window. And there always used to be a, um, like, a, uh, like a catwalk down the middle of the room, to, um, medium sitting here and people sitting around. And this huge bush just suddenly apported itself into the middle of the roots. Roots and all, soil and all, everything um, in the middle of the storm. So uh, this energy is powerful, but if we can use it in a constructive way, in a way that people can. Look at what happened with the bang system, with those paintings. They weren't in a dark room. Nobody was afraid, they just sat there and let the painting manifest itself. And then it, it was picked. So we need to be looking at how we can, and what about how many of you actually work with your mediumship? Can I ask you? In a minute, just let me get to the end of this and we will. Um, what about using this to empower your mediumship, to help to sustain you through a demonstration? How would you think about using that? Yeah? Because that's what they were doing, the uh, Emmas, the Estel Roberts, the Murag Moritz. That's what they were doing. And that could make a big difference just in the quality and depth of our demonstrating mediumship. Yes, I'll take your question. Part of that is I know by sitting with my husband in physical mediumship, it's really brought my mediumship on yes. tremendously. Absolutely. But we sit in the dark with black hair 
And you're saying it's not necessary no, it's not. to do that? It's not. I've never sat in no. a blacked out room no, ever don't need to do during that. my physical mediumship. There's always been some form of light in we it. get light coming in. Yeah, you room pitch dark and you get light coming in. Yeah, because the spirit will want light in it. The circle at school, some of you yeah. may remember school. So it's like it down. Yeah, the the Stephen Upton sat in dark and he took his down. And he said with his physical mediumship, it took him about six months to adapt to the change in the lighting conditions, but he never looked back after that. But at school, they were asked by the spirit world to put an empty glass dome in the room. You know, like yeah, yeah. clocks go in a glass dome. And they lit it from inside with no nothing in the skull circle. They, and they could put the light up and down to their heart's content in this glass dome in the skull circle. So we can work in light. Yes, it's true that certain strong artificial light is, isn't conducive to enabling certain forms of physical mediumship. That is a fact. But um, natural light is something we can work with, most certainly. And light that's controllable, that the spirit world can control and use uh, as they choose to, uh, then we can work with that in physical mediumship. But I'm talking about using it uh, for today's needs. So what are today's needs? to empower all aspects of mediumship, including healing. And I do think healing should be well up top of that list because that's where we can truly uh, make a big difference um, in our world, most certainly. So if I can just take that down. So, this is meant to be a tutorial, not a lecture. <laughs> and you know what that means, don't you? It means doing, not just listening. So it's time to start doing something with this energy. Are you ready? Yeah. yeah. Some of you are lucky like you are, some of you are not. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, uh, what we're talking about is, um, just let me just close this down. How, how can we um, tap into, connect to, and utilize this physical energy? So I'm going to suggest to you some ways that you can do that. We have to remember if we're dealing with healing, if we're using purely magnetic energy, that is magnetic healing. So we have to remember that if we're doing that, that's just us using our connection to the physical energy. And we're missing out on the intelligent mind of the spirit world who can diagnose the patient's needs, take the universal energy and modulate that to be right for that patient. Make it just like a doctor decides what kind of pill do you need, they're deciding what healing energy you need. But they don't have direct access to that physical energy because they're not within a physical world. We are. So what if we can offer to them also to add into that equation some physical energy? How do you think that would work? Yeah? That makes sense to you. So we need to empower the physical energy and they do the rest. So their intelligent mind is deciding and the healing is still the healing medium is still attuning to the spirit world so they're not becoming depleted because they're working in the flow that's coming through so we're not talking about using magnetic healing we're talking about using spiritual healing but utilizing that physical energy and enabling the spirit world to be able to direct it where it needs to go 
within the healing. So would you like to do an experiment? <laughs> you just say, say yes, Judy, but I might as well call <laughs> Because if you say no, we might as well pack up and go. <laughs> so let's just have a think how we're going to do that. So we need to connect to that physical energy. But our intent is also to connect to the spirit world and allow them to work with it. So we need to put the intent in place because what the intent is, is the purpose, it sets the plan. Does that make sense to you? Mind sets the plan. So the spirit will know they've been put on, on standby, ready for this. They're getting ready. Um, what I would like you to do, each of you, is just now plan one person that you would like to send healing to. Just one person, please, just for this experiment. Just decide, let it be the first person who comes into your mind, whatever you want. Just have that thought there. We're not going to do anything with it just yet, just so that you're ready. So when we come to that time, you're not going to think about it. Is that okay? So you just know who you've decided upon is going to be the recipient of this wonderful healing that we're going to do. Yes? Yes. What's the answer? Yes. yes. That's better. That's immediately energy, you see, isn't it? Because it's enthusiasm, it's excitement, and you're putting the right positive energy into it. So what we're going to do now, we've made the intent, we've put on standby the person who's going to receive the healing, and we're now just going to focus ourselves on our connection to the physical energy. And I just want you to kind of think about just sort of soles of your feet, just connecting into this earth that sustains us. Just letting yourself begin to feel that earth energy in which we're connected, we're connected within its auric field, everything. Beneath our feet is crystal energy, mineral energy, fossil energy, heat energy, magnetic energy. It's all there and we are connected to it. So just in your own way, just becoming aware of it. And I'm not going to say how you become aware of it, just know that it's there. How do you feel as you allow it to, to make its connection with you? into your auric field, you have an electromagnetic field around you that comes from your physical body, an aura from your mental state, your emotional state, but just that physical auric energy that's around you, an electromagnetic energy field, connecting you, plugging it in to that earth energy beneath us. And if you like, if you feel it helps, just using your breath, as you breathe in, just kind of connecting to it, breathing it into your auric field, that energy that you live in all the time. And as you breathe it out, allowing it to flow into your auric field to empower it. Just, it's just symbolically using the breath, not factually as a, a rhythm to drawing in that energy and allowing it to empower the energy around you. <coughs> and that's the same as doing those magnetic passes, but we're doing them with our mind. We don't need to do them with our physical hands. We are drawing on that energy that those mediums use and empowering the energy around us. And as we do so, our auric energy expands and empowers. And I just want you to see what it feels like as we're doing that. How you feel yourselves. And just acknowledging if it changes, what you feel, how you feel yourself. First of all, as it's 
surrounding you, it is affecting you too. So it may be that the first thing that's happening is that this is enabling healing energy to build also to help you as well. So once we build this energy, we allow it to build, give permission for it to build. We want to put that thought out now to the spirit world. To just now make that connection. Allow them to connect in to this wonderful space that we have built, this sacred space. Allowing them to connect in to us, with us, through their <coughs> energy. Now we're linking that universal energy, the God force, whatever you conceive it to be, being directed by the spirit world and connecting that up with the physical energy, allowing them to have access to the physical energy that we create. <coughs> And I don't know whether you can feel it, but I can feel very cold energy around my lower legs and so on. And that indicates to me physical energy, definitely. So just feeling that, connecting together, offering the spirit world the physical energy for them to work with. And in your own time, when you feel ready, just bring your patience through your thoughts into this energy. Think of them. Either think of their visual image, think of their name, just think of their presence. Just connect them in to this energy that we've built, into this image. And allow the spirit world to do their work. Their intelligent mind knows what your patient needs. Don't try to tell them what they need. They know. Let them work on your patient and just become an observer. Just try to sense and feel and notice each of you may respond in different ways. You may be aware of colours or even possible sounds, tones, or feelings, pressure changes as that energy is working. aware, be observant of what they're doing in any way that you can. <coughs> Just remember that healing energy flows from spirit, through spirit, to spirit. So without question, you are also receiving healing as it flows through you. No question. And if you learn to work with this, observe the changes in the energy or do you feel yourself what are you aware of
this goes on, eventually you should become aware at some point, each of you individually, when the spirit world are bringing it to a close. You just know there's something we're unable to know. But they're not ending the healing. They're just completing this part of the healing. The energy that's been utilised will continue with your chosen patient from this moment forward. But as you're aware that they're coming to a close, you sense perhaps them drawing away. All in your own time. You're not all what the same, you're all different. It's allowing that process <coughs> to complete itself with the spirit world in charge. things that I would suggest you might want to do <coughs> is maybe later get in touch with your chosen patient and ask them how they feel and would they aware of anything at about 20 past 4 this afternoon test it test it out Or do they feel better? Do they feel different? We only did five minutes. So imagine what, if you wanted to stay with this and work with it, what you could achieve. First of all, can I ask you, how did you feel on the general principle of not having to be focusing on sending healing to the patient, but just allowing the patient to come into the energy. How did you think about that? <coughs> yeah, it's a lot easier. So, <coughs> the other thing is, when we're sending, we're interfering in it. We're actively doing something instead of letting the spirit work be in charge. So this is how I work with my arts and healing all the time. I prefer to work that way. Um, so that's a different way of working, rather than thinking of sending healing. Because then we're getting involved and that is much more kind of magnetic energy and getting in the way, rather than allowing them to work. And normally, we would let this run for longer, you in your own way, whatever, how long you want. And you can do more than one patient working with it. But the question I want to ask you is, could you feel with physical energy? Yes. yes. Has anybody here feel they've received something, some healing from that session? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I work with it because I definitely have big physical problems. Even standing is an issue for me now with the spinal surgery that I've had. But because I want to continue to do my work, I work with myself with every day on physical healing every day in order to help me as much as possible to be able to continue. So from spirit, through spirit, to spirit. But we're adding in that energy that they can utilize and access, <coughs> physical energy. Could any of you feel a change in the temperature? Yes. Physical energy is always cold, cold energy. 
and usually lower down too, you know, close, but knees down sort of thing. So that was a very quick, practical experiment, looking at what we might be able to do and what we can do working with the physical energy. What if those of you demonstrate now, give yourself a bit of time to do that connecting before you go out on the platforms. I'm not talking about bringing in the healing bit, but putting, bringing that energy in. Remember, we have this electromagnetic field around us, and it can be expanded tremendously. They say that Sai Barbers are, you can see it for miles, I don't know if that's true or not. But the thing is, it is a living energy. And if we can empower it, that's exactly what they did. Estelle Roberts, Emma Harding's Britain, Laura Morris, they empowered themselves and it sustained them so that they could work the big halls and do it week in and week out. Estelle Roberts demonstrated to the Royal Albert Hall for thousands of people. She had the power to do it. And it's there, you saw it on that photograph, that newspaper, just an ordinary camera photograph. And so I think, me, this is me speaking now, we've kind of forgotten that. There are things from our history that belong in the museum, like dinosaurs and whatever else. There are the airplanes that the Wright brothers flew. <coughs> but we can also learn from the past. And these powerful mediums knew how to use the physical energy. They did. I'm not talking about ectoplasm or anything like that. Just using that power to enable their mediumship to be sustained. Thank you very much. Questions. It is 4.30 and that's whether you may be going somewhere else, I don't know. Does anybody have any pressing questions? No? That's good. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll try and take one or two quickly then. It is 4.30. Yes, of course. If you need to go, by all means. I'm very interested in finding more out about the uh, magnetic passes. Can you recommend a reading on that? Probably if you, nowadays, if you go online, you'll find a lot of information. Most of the books are pretty old fashioned that are in existence. Mm -hmm. um, a friend, of, there are courses too, my, a very good friend of mine works with the magnetic passes and the mesmeric energy. Um, so there are schools and organisations that you can. Uh, <coughs> Follow up. There are lots of the books are very old, old fashioned books. Yeah, thank you. Yes. If you'd like to experiment with various paintings or maybe you could start the same kind of energy, down below to leave stuff. Yeah, I don't think I don't think that really matters. The the picture is just the connection, isn't it? Or were you meaning about the photographer? Yeah. Yeah, the photographer, yeah, by all means. Just put the photographic paper maybe under your chair. And then afterwards, you need to develop it in a, a dark room, put it through the, you know, the, the um, developer, and then the wash, and just let it dry. And as it dries, it forms. Yeah, so you can experiment with photography, absolutely. We've, we've done it in here, um, and had some, and, uh, you know, also anything. Um, so a while ago, I was doing a trans demonstration in the sanctuary, and Martin Copeland, who was here this week, he's very into photography, the spirit photography. And he said, Do you mind if I take some pictures? And I said, No, it's only a trans den, we're not doing anything physical. And he was packing up his camera, and he said, The spirit world said to him, Take one more. And he took it, and on the last one, you can see the image of my control with his beard and his whiskers and it was just a chance demonstration it was not meant to be but there was obviously some energy there that enabled that to, to show so using using your equipment your laptop things like that try things out we're always Stephen and myself always experimenting with things but that's how we enable the spirit world to show us what they can do now yeah, instead of keep doing what they did before. Okay, thank you very much.